So recently, the writer Catherine D published an article, We Need to Talk About Extreme Antinatalism. I wanted to make a response video to this article because I think there are some key misunderstandings about antinatalism and what it means. And also another thing that she talks about in the article, promortalism, which uh, me personally, I've not fully made up my mind on. And I think I will explore it in videos in the future. But I wanted to respond to this article to go over some of those confusions and hopefully clear them up as I would see it. And I think the mainstream of society really has some big misconceptions about antinatalism. And the more that we can address those, the better. So let's get into the article. So the first thing, and I'm not going to be responding to literally everything in the article, I'm just going to be responding to some key things that I think are worth addressing. And the first one is when Catherine defines promortalism. Now, again, like I said, I would not call myself a promortalist. I don't think I've explored the topic enough. But the definition she gives, I'm sure she got it from somewhere. I, I don't think she would have just made this definition up. But even for me, as someone who doesn't actually even call themselves a pro-mortalist, I don't think this definition is particularly accurate. So the definition she gave is the belief that death is always preferable to life. I can think of instances where someone may be a pro-mortalist, but still think that life may be preferable to death. So one example I could give is someone would be a pro-mortalist themselves. So they would recognize it would be better for me if I were to just stop existing. But but actually, in the grand scheme of things, it's better if I continue existing. This may be because they can do some form of activism to help others, improve the world in some way, which obviously they wouldn't be able to do if they were no longer around. Someone can hold in their head an intellectual belief, like, I think it would be better if I ceased to exist, but actually in reality recognize that actually it would be better if I hung around because I could do good in the world. Now, to be fair, someone could say, oh, well, this belief that death is always preferable to life, maybe they're talking about with respect to the individual. Now then, I that probably would be a decent definition for pro-mortalism, but I think you would need to specify that in the definition. And then in the second paragraph, unless I'm misunderstanding, she says the pro-mortalist community is the provenance of only the most depressed among us. Now, I can understand why someone from the outside would maybe think that, and I'm someone on the outside of this as well. Like, I don't consider myself part of that community, and I, I don't hang around in those spaces, but I know several pro-mortalists, and whilst they have bad times in their lives, like everyone does, they're not particularly depressed people. Some of them, or a lot of them maybe in the community will be, but I don't think that's necessarily tied to pro-mortalism. You can hold an intellectual belief in your head without it being emotionally cumbersome for you. So for example, with antinatalism, a lot of people have this perception that antinatalists are just depressed people, but this really isn't the case. Like sure, there are depressed antinatalists, but there are depressed natalists as well. I consider myself one of the many non-depressed antinatalists. Like I think people see antinatalism and because it views life in a negative way, they think that the people who have this belief always view themselves or their own life or like their existence in a negative way as well. But I don't think that's the case. I think that someone can hold an intellectual belief that is seen as pessimistic, but day to day be relatively optimistic and have a sunny disposition. Like I would consider myself one of those sorts of people. I can recognize that it simply would have just been better for me if I'd have never existed, but I'm here now. So I might as well have as good a time as I can. So I think it is it's easy for someone to characterize antinatalists or, or pro-mortalists as well as a depressed community. And there is some truth to that because there are depressed people in those communities. But I think it's an easy thing to lean into. And I don't think it's really the best way to approach the conversation. I think it's better to approach the conversation by just asking, do these people actually have a valid point? The third thing I wanted to talk about, Catherine brings up this point about how the label child free, which is relatively common now, I think, is becoming prone to slipping into antinatalism. And this is a sort of theme that I think she pulls upon throughout the article. And whilst there might be some truth to this, because I think antinatalism is getting a bit more exposure now, and I think the people who probably have the least resistance to it from a cognitive dissonance point of view are probably the people who have decided they're not going to have kids anyway. So I do think there is some truth there that the child-free community is probably the low-hanging fruit for the antinatalist community. But I think suggesting that the term child-free itself is slipping into antinatalist, I think is maybe pushing it a bit too far. I don't know if actually any research has been done on this, but I would bet a lot of money on the fact that the vast majority of people who voluntarily don't have children probably have never heard of antinatalism. I would, I would say the vast majority. And the two things 
things are just completely different. Now, obviously, there's overlaps. A lot of antinatalists will be child-free, and some child-free people will be antinatalists. But they're fundamentally two different things. So being child-free simply just means that you don't have children. It could be for financial reasons, lifestyle reasons, environmental reasons, literally anything. Maybe you just don't like kids. Like, maybe someone just finds kids annoying, and, and they don't want kids for that reason. Antinatalism is completely different. Antinatalism is an ethical standpoint. It's saying that actually, no, creating sentient life is bad. And one of the ways that sentient life is created is by humans having kids, right? So child free, just as a thing, is basically just saying, it's my personal choice not to have kids. Whereas antinatalism is saying, no, I don't think it's a personal choice to have kids. I think people are harming the person they're creating by creating them. And also an antinatalist doesn't have to be child free. So an antinatalist is just someone who holds this viewpoint, but they could have had kids before, or they could be with a partner who has had kids before, or they could adopt. If an antinatalist who had that ethical standpoint adopted, they would no longer be child free because they're not free from children, right? They've adopted a child. But they would still be antinatalist. I've done a video on this before, which I'll link up above in one of the corners. But yeah, I just wanted to point out that I can understand why maybe Catherine made this observation because child free people are probably the low hanging fruit for antinatalism. But I think saying that child free is slipping into antinatalism is maybe exaggerating it a bit. So this next one, I think is probably one of the most common misunderstandings that people have about antinatalism, which is that we inherently think that life is suffering. I'm not going to lie, many antinatalists do think that. Personally, I don't think that. I think it's more nuanced than just saying life is suffering. I think all antinatalism is, is simply recognizing that before someone exists, they have literally no interest in coming into existence. They don't benefit from coming into existence in any way, but they will be harmed by the suffering and the guaranteed death that they've been signed up for. That doesn't mean all life is suffering. Like once someone exists, they can have an amazing life. All antinatalists are saying is that they never existed in the first place to want that happy life that a lot of people claim unborn fetus weird ghost people want. It's just the joys that will be experienced in a life are not a reason to create someone, but the harms that will be experienced are a reason not to create someone. And we do all this without their consent and we take a massive risk on their behalf. And so all of those things lumped together and more are reasons why antinatalists are antinatalists. It's not necessarily saying all life is suffering. Later in the article, Catherine talks about a term that some child-free people use to refer to children as crotch goblins. There's also some other terms that people use that are sort of, you know, degrading to children. And these are sometimes used in the antinatalist community as well. And I don't think this is something we should shy away from. These are things that happen and these are views people have in both the child-free and antinatalist community. And Catherine's right to point it out. And what I want to just add to her observation is that there are loads of antinatalists that agree with you and don't like this. Me included. I really don't like the vein of child hatred that is present in some antinatalists and some child free circles. Um, I think it's gross personally. I also think it's just downright victim blaming. Like it's not their fault that they exist, like they're kids, like they're not fully cognitively developed yet. So often they don't understand that they can be annoying to people who are more cognitively developed. But just fundamentally, it's not their fault. They didn't choose to create themselves and put themselves in this situation. So personally, I really don't understand this child hatred that sometimes happens. I agree with Catherine. I just wanted to point out there are loads of antinatalists out there that really don't like it and they would join you in condemning it. I just don't want people to maybe read this article and then think that this is a uniform thing among child free or antinatalist people because it isn't and a lot of us are actually actively against it. The last thing I want to respond to is when Catherine is directly talking about the link between antinatalism and promortalism and like I said before I haven't fully made my mind up on this so I'm not in the position to say whether there is a link or not. For the sake of this I'm going to accept that there is a link and in the article Catherine writes Sullivan, Bissett and McGregor offer the analogy of smoking. If you think smoking causes harm you don't only think people should shouldn't start smoking, you believe that people should stop if they already smoke. So I might be misreading this, I fully hold my hands up to that, but one thing that I want to point out, which I want to say because I don't want other people to read this and get the wrong idea, some people seem to think that if someone is antinatalist or pro-mortalist, they may think that it's okay to go around and forcibly stop other people from either procreating or continuing living, and this just isn't the 
case. Someone can hold an intellectual belief in their head, like it's better not to start life or it's better not to continue life. And they might think that's the case for themselves, but also for other people. But that doesn't mean they would go around and forcibly impose that on other people. So let me give an example. Someone may recognize that it's not good to start smoking. And they might also say that people who do smoke now should stop smoking. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to go around and forcibly stop people from smoking cigarettes. Now, again, I'm not saying that Catherine was implying this, but I just want to make it clear. Often, sometimes people see that someone has a specific belief, and then they think that that person only cares about that belief, and then hones in on it and wants to take it to the most extreme point, which isn't the case. Like, when someone holds an ethical belief, it's balanced against all their other beliefs. So, for example, if an antinatalist thinks that it's not good to create new life, and they think that that wouldn't be good if they created new life but it's also not good that other people create new life it doesn't mean they're going to go over and force people to conform to that because the same person may also value bodily autonomy and so these ethical beliefs then have to be balanced against each other right and this is the case for antinatalism and pro-mortalism and also any other ethical belief that people hold and so yeah i just wanted to make that clear as well because i think i'm not saying catherine was doing this but a lot of people are very uncharitable and just take one belief that someone has and take it to the most extreme extent and ignore the fact that the person may have other beliefs that have to balance off with this belief. Anyway, I'm sure that anyone who has read this is going to have other things in the article that they maybe disagree with or think are wrong. There were some things that I decided not to include because I didn't think I was the best person to deal with these things. Let me know in the comments what you guys think of Catherine's article and my thoughts on it and I will see you all in the next one.